so that's that's where you can find archived information on a whole slew of past events. So for this evening, we ha I wanted to thank our sponsors and partners, Ecology, um, Zero Waste Sonoma, Guayaki, the UC Master Garden Program, who are here and sharing. And then, um, just to ground us in, I always look to this resource, the, which is the Drawdown, Project Drawdown, drawdown.org website, the 100 Solutions to Reverse Global Warming. And composting is one of them. And I'm not going to go into too much depth there, because I'll... But they analyzed if we, uh, several scenarios if we adopted composting on a global scale for sort of max, maximized potential, what are some of the um, potential outcomes in ter terms of CO2 equivalent reduction or sequester, and what it'll cost, and what the cost benefits. So um, you can find all this stuff on drawdown.org. I could go into that too much right now, but I just want to call it out. <clears throat> and then this is a photo I found in my archives from 2009. Uh, my daughters and we were, our family were at the Sonoma Compost, which, you know, isn't anymore, uh, getting compost. And um, so Zinzi's going to talk a little bit about this is a facility that used to be down at, on Meacham Road near the dump that was closed down some years ago. And there will be efforts to try to restore or um, increase county based municipal composting. So, tonight, um, it's going to, if, this is our pattern for tonight. Zinzi Tan, who's the Organics Program Manager at Zero, Zero Waste Sonoma, is going to start us off next um, and give us a whole slew of the ins and outs of composting. And then Stefan Stelling from uh, Apple Blossom School and Conservation Works is going to share about a project at Apple Blossom. And then we'll finish it out with sharing some backyard strategies for composting at home. And then I want to just plant a seed for next month. And next month's topic is water resiliency. And it's really about adapting to the impacts of climate change and, and, and the, the fact that we need clean water. So um, we have somebody from Sonoma Water uh, Agency is going to talk about their efforts. And then also a groundwater uh, expert who's going to talk about the state of our wells, monitoring our wells, et cetera, et cetera. So that's um, that's coming up in November, and if you're on, if you signed up, you'll get an email about this um, in a week or so. Pause. <laughs> uh, the organics program manager with Zero Waste Sonoma, and um, I'll be talking about compost as a climate solution today, and kind of. A whole range of things, uh, mainly about what we're doing here in Sonoma County. Okay, so before we start, the first thing I wanted to cover today is uh, what I mean when I say organics. So I'm going to be using this term a lot, organics or organic materials. And the definition of organics that I'm going with is more the chemistry definition. So what has carbon? And um, that mo mainly, we're going to be talking a lot about like um, food scraps, yard debris, plant trimmings. I understand that some people get a little bit confused because when we say organic, the first thing you think of is like USDA organic or organic agriculture. And um, I'll mention that a little bit today, but for the most part in my, in my presentation today, I'll be talking about organics in the context of chemistry with carbon. Okay, so just a little bit about Zero Waste Sonoma. We're what's called a Joint Powers Authority, or a JPA. So we're a government entity that was established in 1992, and we cover uh, a number of responsibilities on behalf of uh, the 10 jurisdictions in Sonoma County. So that includes all eight cities, the town of Windsor, and the county of Sonoma. I manage specifically their organics program, 
but we also have a number of other programs like the Household Hazardous Waste Program. So if you've ever been to um, Central Landfill down in Meacham, there's a HHW facility. Um, we operate that, or we manage that, I suppose. And um, if you've ever seen like uh, electronic waste recycling events, or mattress recycling events, or the HHW Rover that goes around at Sonoma County to pick up uh, you know, your paint, batteries, things like that, that's all managed by us. Uh, we also have um, zero waste planning and policy. So that essentially means uh, we are we write ordinances, we uh, write policies that are all supposed to be trying to extend the life of the landfill. Because uh, if you didn't re if you didn't know previously, the landfill has a lifespan, and you know. It's a hole in the ground, and once it's filled up, then we have to open a new landfill. So at this point, uh, for example, in Sonoma County, we have about 20 years left to our uh, landfill. Uh, so we do a lot of work around that zero waste. Then, of course, attached to all the programs that we work on, education and uh, outreach is a very big part of what we do. So doing presentations like this, or tabling at events, you might see us at the state fair, uh, that's all part of our, uh, our responsibility. And then reporting. I would say reporting is maybe one of the most important parts of our, uh, our role, Zero Waste Sonoma. That was really why we were created in the first place. So in 1992, there was a big state law that basically required all the cities and the county to start reporting to the state how much recycling, how much composting, uh, and how much they were landfilling. And instead of each city having to hire a person to do this, they decided to just combine all their money and create us. So we continue to do this every year. Uh, we um, send in very many reports to the state every year. <laughs> I'm very sick. Okay, so um, obviously today we're going to be focusing on the organics program, what I manage. So here's just a very simplified timeline uh, of the program. So uh, as Tor mentioned, Sonoma Compost opened in 1985, and in 1993, they uh, signed a contract with us, and uh, essentially all of the material that was being collected, or I think actually that was the first year that all the material was being collected curbside, and that was when we first started having a green bin in 1993, that material was now going to Sonoma Compost to get composted. And that year, when it first started, only plant trimmings uh, were accepted and uh, wood chips. So then uh, 2002 was when that program started to accept uh, residential food scraps, like vegetative food scraps, in addition to the plant trimmings. And then in 2006, uh, we started adding in commercial, so businesses, restaurants, things like that. And then in 2015, unfortunately, Sonoma Compost shut down. Uh, for a variety of reasons, the main one being that uh, there was an overflow into Stemple Creek of uh, water. And it's a very complicated situation I won't really go into today. Um, but there is a link to a grand jury report if anyone's interested. So once you get this presentation, you can read all about it. Then in 2020, uh, 2015, because the compost facility shut down, there was no large-scale compost facility in Sonoma County that could accept all of this material, and so we started outhauling to outside of Sonoma County to other compost facilities. Um, as a result of that, uh, I guess I would say the only good thing out of that is that we could now accept meat, bones, and dairy into the green bin, so starting in 2015, in addition to the vegetative food scraps and the yard debris. Oh, and uh, I should mention food soil paper as well, so like paper towels uh, and paper egg cartons are also accepted. So this is the link that I mentioned. If anyone's interested, uh, it's a very illuminating document. <laughs> okay, so here are just some statistics about the program uh, now. I have 2022's numbers up there because it was a full year. But as you can see, we produce almost um, 85,000 tons of residential material. So this is just material that's collected curbside from your green carts, and then uh, commercial material, which is from the businesses where they have a dumpster. 
uh, is about 30,000 tons. So this is uh, a lot, it's over 100,000 tons, and to give you a sense of scale, the smaller composting facilities that we have, like Grab and Grow, I think they only can accept 30,000. It's pretty small. And so the red uh, pinpoints on the map are where the compost facilities are now that we contract with and where we truck the materials. So one is in Marin in Novato, that's the closest one, and then we have one in Napa Recycling, and the third one is Mendocino. Oh, and the yellow pinpoint is where the commercial material goes. So I only manage the residential material, only what goes into the carts. Uh, the commercial material that goes into the dumpsters, uh, I do not manage, and so that goes to a facility down in Michigan. So as part of those contracts that I manage, three, we have annual compost allotments. And in the past few years, I've been organizing a lot of compost giveaways, and uh, Dina and Tor have been great helpers, well, volunteers, essentially organizing um, the compost giveaways in Sebastopol. So if you've been to one of those, show of hands, actually, I was curious. Okay, great. All right. So for those of you who don't know, um, I have a number of these compost giveaway events all across the county. Most of them are in the spring, uh, but we do have some in the summer, and it kind of peters out before. So the last one of the year that I have scheduled is actually in Sebastopol. I want to say it's October 9th, 14th. Thank you. So, um, so this is the link where you can find um, all the compost giveaway events as they're posted. So check it out. I do also want to mention I uh, run a separate program called the Compost Rebate Program, and this is more for people who are buying a large volume of compost. So um, mainly landscapers, like businesses, vineyards, things like that. As long as they buy more than 30 cubic yards of compost in a year, they can get a 10% rebate from us up to $25,000 a year. So you can get that $25,000. Um, so the main thing to remember with this program, um, it is currently an annual program, and uh, you need to sign an agreement, just a short three-page agreement that's on our website uh, before you buy the compost in order to have that purchase qualify for rebate. And uh, we do ask that the compost be applied in Sonoma County because we want all those benefits here in the Okay, so I get this question a lot. Obviously, when people find out we're trucking all of this material out of county where uh, they want to know if we are working on bringing that compost to Sonoma County. And the answer is yes. So uh, currently, Zero Waste Sonoma is involved, is partnering with the County of Sonoma to build a facility on um, existing county land and it's by the Sonoma County Airport. It's on top of a closed landfill and the project is very, very uh, early right now. We're actually, right now I'm on a panel to review proposals that we've received in response to uh, a request for proposals and RFP for 30% engineering and environmental permitting. So uh, we're hoping that we'll choose a winner by the end of the year and they'll start that whole permitting and environmental, or permitting and engineering by the end of this year. And uh, the timeline, projected timeline, is that usually permitting takes about two years, maybe more, then construction takes another two years. But with capital improvement projects like these, they're very complicated and um, anything can happen so it could take longer than that. But uh, that, that facility uh, is one that, like I mentioned, Zero Waste Cinema is working on. The other one that I do want to mention is one that we are not involved with and the county is also not involved with. It's being uh, pursued independently by a, um, and privately funded. It's by State Challenge. So uh, they've been working on this for a number of years. I don't know if some of you have heard about it. Uh, but it is out by Lakeville Highway, and they have a draft environmental impact report, a draft EIR, currently under review by Permit Sonoma. And I don't know what their timeline is because that, that EIR has been in review for a few years now. So um, we're hopeful that they will also get off the ground because the more composting facilities we have, the better. Uh, and this kind of plays into the state law where now everybody has to have a green bin you know, having more capacity to compost is always good. 
So we're keeping our fingers crossed. Okay, so now I'm pivoting a little bit into talking about kind of the differences between uh, industrial composting versus home composting. So what I've talked about so far uh, with all this big volume of material is all industrial composting, municipal composting, uh, which for some people is, is hard to picture because you've never seen a big composting facility before. However, you've seen home composting, right? Most of you are probably familiar with uh, these two pictures. The one on the left is a warm bin, uh, which Jen has hers in the pink bin back there, so it looks very similar to that. And, um, you know, it's small enough that you can even keep this in your closet, right? People in apartments can have their warm bins, and uh, it's great for like a small family. Or otherwise, maybe you have a backyard bin, and um, as you can see, this one is like a lasagna style. Um, but these are pretty small, I mean, I would say probably less than a cubic yard, uh, but they're very small. Now, in comparison, an industrial composite facility very large volumes. Uh, as you saw the numbers, we're dealing with thousands of tons every year, and so uh, the piles are could be as big as a building, right? They could be as high as 20 feet. Um, and they generally are uh, faster, and so I guess I should move on to the next one. Uh, so this is kind of a snapshot of the differences. So. Home composting is uh, much lower temperature than industrial composting, and as a result, I'm sure most of you know that uh, if you're composting at home in your backyard or using a worm bin, uh, you should only really put vegetative food scraps in there. No meat, no bones, no dairy, right, because otherwise you get pests. However, uh, at an industrial scale, because it's so hot and because uh, the material moves through the facility so fast, they can compost all the meat, the bones, the dairy, even shells if you have oysters. Um, and this is something that I, I want to emphasize because even now, even though we've had this program, people have had green bins for years, a lot of people don't realize that you can put meat, bones, and dairy and you know, shells in there. So all food scraps can go into your green bin. And they do get composted at these big compost facilities. So because of the heat also, it kills weed seeds. Uh, so you can put your weed seeds in there, um, and it kills most of the pathogens like E. coli and uh, some of them up. There are pros and cons to both, obviously, and with the home composting, it's hyper-local. Uh, it's something that I always encourage because, uh, you know, we are reducing greenhouse gas, em uh, gas emissions. Even if you have a green bin, it's always good to have a, uh, something at home that you're composting because it just reduces the amount of material that's being trucked. Um, and so the amount of greenhouse gases that are uh, being produced. But it is uh, more work and it's you know, low tech, so obviously whoever has, if you have a home composting system, you have to do the work great. You have to turn it, <laughs> you have to put water, all of that. Whereas uh, at an industrial facility, it's all centralized. It is further away, but they have a lot of um, different kinds of equipment and very high tech uh, methods, uh, including <coughs> Like I mentioned, like the grinders to grind up like wood or loaders that you saw earlier in that picture, um, turners and screeners, so all of this equipment. Um, and then I do want to mention, I've included this link here. So Napa Recycling, which is one of the facilities we send our material to, they made this really nice video so you can kind of um, see what a composting facility looks like. This video also shows uh, what a material recovery facility looks like, MRF or MRF. Uh, that is what is colloquially known as a recycling facility, so where they sort all your recyclables. So if you are interested in seeing what it looks like, um, check out this video. Okay, so compost is a climate solution, right? So um, composting, I feel like most people understand if you're putting things into your green bin, that means it's not going into the gray bin, therefore it's not going into the landfill. So that makes sense, right? Because when materials, when organic materials go into the landfill, they uh, decompose anaerobically without oxygen, and that's what causes them to create that methane, which is a very harmful greenhouse gas, and contributes to climate change, right? So most people understand that's one of the main benefits of um, using your green bin of composting. 
uh, and you know, the cycle of the nutrients, obviously, so we're reusing all of that as nature intended. However, I feel that uh, in, in talking to people, a lot of people don't connect how that, uh, the other part of it, the carbon sequestration part, um, and they don't connect how that um, connects to climate change. And so the other piece of it is, of course, using compost. So when you put compost down on your soil, it helps plants grow larger. And um, it, the, that's gonna hurt us, sorry, the blue equation down in the bottom is, uh, I'm sure most of you have seen that at some point, maybe in high school, uh, but that's a very simplified, one small piece of the carbon cycle, where um, you know you have uh, carbon dioxide in the air that we breathe, you have water, you have energy from the sunlight, and that turns into glucose, into sugar, and it turns into carbon dioxide, or uh, sorry, oxygen, <laughs> at, the, at the end. And so that glucose uh, is like leaves, stems, wood, and so, uh, as I mentioned, when you put down compost, it helps plants grow bigger, and so we suck up more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and uh, turn it into um, like stable carbon in, in plants or in the soil. Uh, and of course, compost has a whole slew of benefits, uh, especially when you compare it to using artificial fertilizers. Uh, it helps increase um, soil porosity, so water can trickle through a lot better. Um, roots can go through a lot easier. Uh, there's more microorganisms, there's a better pH for the soil, and uh, uh, what's it called? So it reduces soil erosion um, and increases water retention. So, you know, uh, one of the things that you might hear if you come next month when you're talking about water is uh, with <coughs> more plants or more vegetation to soak up water, you have, um, you mitigate not only drought but also flooding because all of that's getting soaked in instead of just totally running off. And so compost is magical, it's great. So I wanted to show this picture, uh, I don't know if maybe some of you have heard of the Marin Carbon Project, anybody show me? Okay, great, some of you. Um, so this is a picture from one of their studies that was done and you can see they apply just one inch layer, it was one inch, it might have been less but just one inch layer of compost onto uh, a patch of ground. And um, on the far right side is a control where they didn't do anything. And then you see uh, where they put compost, uh, where they plowed and no compost. And then the last one was compost and plowing. And so you can see uh, the cows, where you see more cows means that there's more vegetation. So uh, obviously compost was very influential um, or there was a significant increase in the amount of vegetation that was growing, and so all the cows went to those sectors. So this is uh, one example of how cool compost can be. Uh, and the other thing too is, I think with this experiment, they only put down compost one time, that one inch layer, and the ground continued to sequester carbon for years. So compost has kind of, uh, uh, what's that? Yeah. What was that? Healing properties. <laughs> oh, yeah, healing properties, that's right. Yeah, and just it's once you put down compost, it's really good for the soil. I mean, just one application is great, but um, you know, a lot of farmers, for example, they uh, put down compost every year. So, uh, and here are a few more pictures that I wanted to include to really demonstrate the benefits of compost. So, as I mentioned, you know, compost is great at increasing porosity in soil, and so that allows the plant, plant roots uh, to grow a lot fuller. Um, evidenced by uh, the two pictures on the left and the bottom. Um, and then the image on the top right is from Soil Haiti, which uh, I got the chance to listen to them speak, or someone from Soil Haiti, once, and they essentially are composting, because Haiti is an island, uh, they are composting human waste, so poop, and then they use that compost on their uh, plants, and it makes a difference, you know? So it's super great. I do want to mention briefly what is not compost. So on occasion, I also get questions about um, these countertop composts, composters, uh, like Lomi, if you've heard of Lomi, uh, or uh, the newer one is called The Mill. They are not composters because, uh, <laughs> especially Lomi, uh, they're trying to fix this, but for years they've been marketing their products 
as uh, you plug it in, and it's essentially like a small appliance. You put food scraps in, and then within 24 hours, you have compost. And that's too fast. There's no way that's compost. All it's doing is it's uh, macerating your food scraps and it's dehydrating them. Uh, but if you put it, if you put whatever comes out of the, these countertop composters onto your garden bed, it will mold <laughs> because it's not compost. Um, so this picture here, it's kind of hard to see with the light, but um, essentially this, this picture is showing what happens when you take the, the ground food out of loamy and you just wet it with some moisture, like, you know, say it rains on your garden and then it just grows you mold. So compost doesn't do that. Compost doesn't grow mold because it's finished. There you go, thank you. So uh, these, these two pictures are what they look like. So the top one is a loamy and the bottom one is the milk. Okay, so the next thing I'll talk about is um, the state law. So uh, how many of you have heard of SB 1383? Um, so it's a very big state law, and it was passed, uh, was written into law by Governor Brown in 2016, and it was started, it started being effective in January 1st of 2022. So by now it's been almost two years that it's been in effect. Um, and it's a very influential state law, it's a, one of the, I'd say one of the most significant waste reduction laws in the country, if not in the world. Uh, because of how much it's requiring everybody to do. So one of the big things is, um, these are all the things that the law requires uh, jurisdictions to do. And so, let's see. So the jurisdictions have to have collection services, so essentially um, have the bins, have the trucks to come by and pick up for recycling and organics. Uh, then they have to have contamination minimization, which means that usually uh, at least in Sonoma County, we send, we, well, Recology and the other haulers send out people um, and they open the lids, like they kind of randomly pick bins and they open the lids to check for contamination and if they see contamination, they will send out like a notice or education to correct people's behavior. Uh, waivers, there are some businesses that don't generate a lot of organic material, so if you think of like an auto body shop, they're not going to have anything to compost. So, uh, they get waivers from this law, and it is the responsibility of the jurisdictions, well, really it's me, <laughs> uh, to issue these waivers. And then the education and outreach to make sure everybody understands the requirements. Um, there is an edible, edible food recovery uh, program. I won't really talk about it, but our next speaker will be uh, talking about part of it with Apple Blossom uh, School. But essentially, that is uh, for large food producing businesses like supermarkets or grocery stores or schools that uh, have excess food that's not getting eaten and sending that to uh, feed people, like a food bank, instead of throwing it away into the landfill or even composting it because we want, you know, highest and best use of that food. And then there's compost and mulch procurement. Uh, that I'm not really get, gonna get too much into that, but that's to kind of spur markets for compost and mulch, especially in Southern California, where uh, they, don't, they don't really uh, value compost as much as we do here in Southern County. Uh, recycled paper procurement is basically requiring all the government entities like your cities and county to purchase recycled content paper products. Uh, again, kind of spurring market development. Um, edible food generators, that's kind of in regards to the edible food program. Uh, and then inspection and enforcement, just to make sure that people are doing what they're doing. So the main thing that residents and businesses need to know is that you, you need to have a green bin, if you don't already have one, and you need to use it correctly. Uh, and so there is a statewide goal of uh, reduction of 75% of organic material in landfill by uh, 2025 and an increase, a 20% increase in the amount of food that's being <coughs> recovered, and when I say recovered, I mean like donated, um, by 2025 as well. And, so, one of the things I do really want to hit on is contamination. So, uh, obviously now with, uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are, I'm, I'm kind of preaching the choir, but you all care about this stuff. However, now with the state law, there are people who are using the green bin for the first time and they have no idea what to do. 
or they don't care very much about keeping it clean. And what I mean by keeping it clean is making sure that your recyclables go into your recyclables, your organic material that's compostable goes into your compost your green bin, uh, and then everything else goes in the trash, making sure they all go into the, to the right location. Um, and this is particularly important for the green bin because there's not really a very efficient way to get out all of um, the trash. Like if there's trash in a big pile of food, it's, it's really hard for them to get, out, uh, get that stuff out. And the two biggest, I would say, culprits of contamination are plastics and glass. So plastics, microplastics, I'm sure all of you have heard about microplastics and how it's probably in us, it's in the water that we drink, and it ends up in the soil that we have because um, part, part of it is from the compost. Uh, but then also glass is a really big contaminant. So uh, one bottle of glass can, once it shatters, it contaminates the whole batch of compost. And if you can imagine that finished compost is getting sold to farmers and ranchers and humans get hurt because you're digging in your garden, or animals get hurt because they get cut by the glass. So um, plastic and glass, terrible. I do want to mention compostable plastic products because that is also a question I get a lot. In Sonoma County, we do not accept compostable plastic products in the green bin, so that stuff has to go into the trash. And there are, I would say, a lot, I, there are only a few, like a handful of facilities in, in California that actually accept compostable plastic products and actually compost them because they're so problematic. And uh, there are two main reasons. So one is that, um, at least in California, a lot of the compost that's being produced is, fi the finished compost is certified uh, organic for organic agriculture. And the National Organic Program, uh, which is headed by the USDA, sees compostable plastic products as a synthetic, because it is synthetic, it's man-made. Um, and so they don't allow that material to be in the compost and still be certified organic for agriculture. So that is one reason our compost facilities don't want to. The other one, which I think is really the bigger problem, is that um, these compostable plastic products look very similar to um, general petroleum-based plastic products. So those two pictures, those two cups, I literally went on a webstaurant, which is a website where you can buy all this like, foodware. One is compostable plastic, the other one is petroleum-based number one um, PET plastic. Can you tell the difference? <laughs> well, if you can't, the composters also can't. So imagine if this cup is in a huge pile of food, they're not going to be able to tell, and so um, for the composters, if they see it, they're just going to uh, pull it out and they're going to chuck it. So, uh, for them, it's just a lot easier to say, no, uh, we don't want this at all. Here are some pictures of um, contamination. So, as I mentioned, uh, some of the contamination that we see is from people who just don't care and maybe they're just using their green bin as an additional trash bin. Uh, case in point, um, the two pictures on the bottom are actually pictures I received just in the recent months from the compost facility. And I spy with my little eye, there's a concrete piece over there. <laughs> Somebody put concrete in their green bin. That's not compostable. Um, and you know, like some people do put trash, like I said, in the green bin, but sometimes it is people who mean well and they put things that they think are compostable, but they're not. So um, the compostable plastic products is one. The other one is paper plates. Uh, so paper plates, if they, the way that I tell people how to determine whether or not they're compostable or if they have a plastic lining on them is if you put food or oil, you know, on your paper plate and it soaks in, there's no, there's no plastic lining in that. So yes, you can compost that. That's great. However, if there's a plastic lining on it and your plate, you know, sits with, uh, I don't know, like sloppy joes or something for hours and it's totally fine, there's plastic lining on it. So we don't want that. So no, uh, if the paper plate has a plastic lining on it, put it in the trash. Uh, and then produce stickers are a really big one. So you know, if you eat the banana peel, make sure to peel off the produce sticker because um, that's really easy to miss. Uh, my mom does it all the time. I still have to remind her. Uh, but you know, make sure you.
peel that off because that, again, turns into microplastics. So that's the picture, upper left. Um, and the other ones are uh, sort of just packaging, random packaging with um, vegetables especially. You know, if you have a twist tie with your broccoli, or I've seen people just dump a whole bag of carrots that have um, uh, gotten really gross in their fridge, and they don't bother to shake it out. Uh, that all is contamination. That's why plastic, glass especially, are really bad. Metal, they can at least, you know, pull out with um, the magnets. It's not ideal to put metal in your green bin, but, um, but with plastic and glass, there's no magnet for that, so. Okay, so what you can do. Um, as I mentioned already, do your best and you know keep your blue and your green bins clean. If you don't know or you have questions or you have some sort of doubt about um, whether or not you want to put something into one of the bins, uh, call us or call one of your uh, your franchise haulers. So for Sebastopol, you're being serviced by Recology Soon and Marin, um, and so please ask all these questions. Uh, and then I did include the link uh, to the recorded home composting, like backyard composting or vermicomposting videos that Jen uh, did over the pandemic. So uh, those are free resources if anyone wants to do that. And these are some other resources. So just other links uh, if people are interested. The UC Master, Pro uh, Master Gurners program is great. Uh, they also have a Master Preservers program, if some of you have not heard of that, so about like canning, kimchi, and things like that. Um, and then uh, the Carbon Cycle Institute is local, so Sonoma County, and they do a lot of work with like, carbon sequestration, a lot of uh, research being done there. Uh, Marine Carbon Project, also a lot of research and things done there. Uh, and BioCycle is uh, one of the websites that I read a lot. It's, it's kind of heavy in the jargon, <laughs> Because it's more like industry news, but it's all about like composting and um, yeah, all of that stuff. So if you're interested. And this is my information if you want to reach out to me. So thank you very much. Yeah, let's take a few questions. So the question was about lumber and whether there was a pathway for lumber to get composted. And yes, so if you have small pieces of wood, say like a fallen tree branch, um, you can definitely put that in your green bin. And uh, for larger pieces, like say, uh, I don't know, like for example, construction and demolition, uh, they usually that material uh, people get like a special debris box, say from Recology, and that goes to, um, there is a sorting facility at Central Landfill just for construction and demolition, and they do pull out all that wood and it gets composted. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. And then Bob, I think you were back there first. Yeah, I was, I was pretty um, disappointed that the RCPA ballot measure seems to have gotten derailed. And given that, given how important uh, you know, composting is to climate drawdown. Uh, is is zero waste Sonoma going to come up with another funding mechanism to help you know spread the compost? Uh, yeah. So the question was because our CPA's um, efforts got derailed. Is zero waste Sonoma going to come up with a funding mechanism to um, increase compost or increase compost? Increase uh, on working lands, on ranches, farmlands. Yeah, uh, so rangers and farmland is what the question was about. So um, for us at Zero Waste Sonoma, we admittedly, we mostly focus on residents and businesses and not so much the agricultural community. However, the resource conservation districts, uh, we have two in Sonoma County. One is Gold Ridge a Resource Conservation District and the other one is Sonoma RCD. Uh, they do apply for a lot of grants um, and uh, help farmers and ranchers use more compost, understand uh, better sustainable uh, farming practices. Um, so if you're interested, I can, I can connect you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I, I would say, I, I just thought about, there's a lot more education that's needed. Perhaps that's a dumb observation, but 
if you have schools or anybody, any organization, it's like getting clean, clean, putting clean materials into the bed is like half the problem, half the challenge. Maybe. Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, we're actually working on a educational campaign uh, that's supposed to come out next year that's going to focus all about contamination in the green bin. And we're going to, um, I'm hoping to launch it in the spring and concurrent with all the compost giveaways. May I ask a question? I work with a lot of like teenagers and students from all over Sonoma County, but I feel like particularly in the Rosen district, we're always like, we don't have green bins at our apartment complexes, at our homes, at our like what what resources can I give them without maybe getting them in trouble with building bars? <laughs> yeah. to, to help bring composting. Definitely. So the question was about um, if there are say like apartment buildings or you know a business that doesn't have a green bin or you know residents complaining about how they don't have access to a green bin to compost their food scraps uh, what do you do what resources are there so yeah please reach out to us at Zero Waste Sonoma or me specifically uh, or Recology and um, they can help you get set up or the apartment buildings get set up because it is required by the law now and um, starting in 2024 uh, there are going to be monetary penalties um, being fine well finding all these non-compliant businesses, so they have to do it. So I guess my question would be like, if the families that live in the homes are maybe not legal citizens and they're concerned, mm -hmm. like what are the, so that they're not the one doing it, but like they're still supporting them in getting that resource? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's still the same thing, because especially with a, an apartment building, you don't have to mention who it is that uh, can tag yeah. yeah. But uh, if you just know the general address, yeah, and you tell that to Recology or you tell that to us, um, or even to one of your cities, um, then they will, we or staff will come and like take care of it and we'll talk to, or mainly Recology, we'll talk to the apartment building uh, property manager and get that. So. Is there like a timeline for? Uh, a timeline for getting all that set up? Or, or yeah, I mean, I guess I know folks are like, yeah, we called nothing happened. Or is there, and I don't know who they called or. What, but I'm just curious. Yeah. Students have a lot of questions. Like, oh, no, <laughs> yeah. So the question was about a timeline uh, for getting all this set up. It, it does kind of depend, and especially with, with multifamily apartment buildings, they're really tricky because you have to go through multiple uh, layers. So, you know, even if Recology has uh, contacted the property manager and said, you have to do this as a state law, they, they can promise empty promises and then they don't actually do it or I know uh, some apartment buildings like hide their green bin <laughs> so the residents can't even use it or um, sometimes uh, you, you, if they have a cart they have to roll it out to the curb and the apartment staff don't do that so then it never ends up getting service so there are a whole host of problems um, so I, I would say the answer to your question is it kind of depends okay. it's still false but I'm just curious yeah, yeah. Let's let's give Zinzi a big hand because we she's gonna be around if you wanna hear her off for questions. And then I'm gonna introduce uh, Stefan Stelling who's gonna tell us some story from Apple Blossom School and Orchard View. And okay, we're doing this. Stefan, and I work uh, with a couple of different programs, projects. Um, I have my own company, Wood Solutions, and I teach at Apple Blossom. I'm the gardener and teacher at Apple Blossom in Sebastopol. And as part of that garden program, we also uh, manage the lunch collection, the snack collection of food. Um, so and I'm actually not too knowledgeable about the food recovery. Um, Part of that, I think it's AmeriCorps who kind of takes that on, as far as the food from the cafeteria that is not used, I think they collect it. So um, I do food recovery for pigs, we'll see in a second. So um, I'm not scrolling on Instagram here, I'm going to use this as a remote. So, um, I also am really heavily relying on Sunny 
gallery from Intercollegiate School, which is right above uh, Boston. And um, her students are really integral to our program, making that process work. And I'll show you exactly how that works in a bit, but we couldn't do it without Sunny. Um, and for decades now, I guess, Sunny has been doing a fabulous job. So um, I've known uh, Sunny for a long time uh, through another organization that I'll talk to talk about in just a little bit um, that kind of led into where we are here. Um, so at Apple Blossom, uh, we have what we call the Waste Wizards. Uh, it's a program that uh, we have students who are um, voluntold to participate um, in their fourth and fifth graders uh, who uh, take on a duty to do the Waste Wizards program. And I'll explain a little bit about that and how that all works. Um, Basically, I'm going to talk about uh, six different parts of this program here. Um, our connections between waste and climate change that we talk about in the classroom, and uh, what we do with our scraps, our food waste, and so forth. Uh, how we use compost in our garden, um, how we do with science. Um, I come from a little bit of a science background in um, elementary school, so I'll talk a little bit about the NGSS, the Next Generation Science Standards, and how they integrate with this. Um, and, uh, primarily schools. Um, so we introduced the whole concept in the first part in the class of the year because I'm a garden teacher and also the waste wizards management. Um, it works out really well uh, because I see all the students, so it's TK through five, fifth grade, um, and in a two-week rotation I see all the kids. So it's a good way to expose everybody to consistent messaging rather than asking teachers to individually uh, teach that to their class. Um, and basically, it's the procedures for cleanup that I share with the kids. Um, and depending on the grade level, focus a little bit more, a little bit less on um, climate change and other uh, science interactions. Um, and then in garden class, we enforce that throughout the year. Um, one of the things, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, we have a program or a, a lesson called Recycling Changes Everything that uh, came out of uh, an organization called the Compost Club that was started by Rick K 20 some years ago maybe, yeah, 20 years ago, I think about. Um, and uh, so kind of piggybacking off of the Compost Club and the lessons that we developed there and uh, this lesson in class. Um, it's primarily geared for fifth grade, but you know, you can kind of scale it up and down depending. Um, and uh, so some other kids doing that lesson there, every step and changes everything else. Um, as far as where our food goes, uh, we have a farmer in Sebastopol, Farmer Nancy, who has allowed us to feed her pigs. And so we are able to um, basically single stream all of the food waste into a pig bucket. Um, and the big challenge with the pig bucket is making sure it is contamination free. So that I would say is more than half the battle with all of our uh, recycling and composting efforts is making sure the right stuff gets in the right bin. Um, we have a lot of volunteers that help with that, so not just the kids who are voluntold, but uh, we have some parents who uh, participate in, and uh, I don't know, maybe there's high school students, I don't really deal with high school kids too much, that's Sunny's uh, group, but I think there's a couple of high schoolers who drive so they can take the pig buckets. Just anecdotally, we don't actually measure it yet, but um, it's somewhere between 15 and 70 pounds a day of food waste that's getting generated that goes to the pigs. So, um, it's a, I live my bike here, but I don't really have the capacity to carry that on my bike. I don't have a trailer, so um, 14 miles to the gallon in the truck it is for that. Uh, so, here's who gets to eat it. They're very happy. They're extremely excited every day to see me when I bring it, and I'm sure everybody else who brings it too. Um, the remaining stuff, the contaminated, uh, food contaminated paper, um, goes into the green bin, but of course, this is a picture of what happens when uh, we don't have room for that stuff. So we do a little bit of dumpster dancing to try to get it in, and now I think we're getting uh, twice a week uh, green bin pickup. So you know that varies depending upon the year and landscaping uh, concerns on the campus. So uh, our compost needs in our garden, it's a pretty small garden. We have 10, 20 square foot beds, so 200 square feet of bed space. Um, and then a couple of fruit trees and some other herb beds and things, so maybe about 900 square feet total of 
uh, space that we might need compost. Um, last year we just got a couple of bags, but it would be great to get a compost uh, cooperative going to school. So um, and the School Garden Network, I'll mention that uh, coming up, uh, we'll be doing a composting uh, and soils workshop in February. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about that, check in with the School Garden Network. Um, the kids really do love the garden. Um, I'll have a short video, hopefully our sound all works out okay on that, and you'll get to hear and see exactly what kids think about food from the garden. Um, we do a little bit of on-site composting of uh, green uh, material from the garden. Um, the kids enjoy it. This is the base of our, uh, of our last year's compost pile. And we do have an existing wound in the system that is there, but the challenge so far is creating that extra fraction of just one appropriate food that the, it's really easy with the pigs because everything goes in there. Anything people eat, pigs can eat. Worms a little more picky. Um, and just the logistics challenge because it's two fourth graders or two fifth graders and one wagon that has to contain everything that is being transported back and forth to lunch. Uh, not quite sure how it's going to work out in another bucket or two for worm food. And then also monitoring that and making sure that gets uh, portioned out correctly and only the appropriate stuff goes. But we're going to work on it this year and we'll, we'll work through the challenges. Um, as far as the science that we uh, are able to work into that curriculum, um, I kind of combed through the NGSS, Next Generation Science Standards, and basically every grade level K through 6 um, is what I was working on previously, has something that can deal with the Next Generation Science Standards in terms of composting. So whether that's habitat, nutrient cycling, you know, uh, watching the, the different organisms that are decomposers or scavengers. Um, and then lastly, um, biochar. I did a biochar to the last year. The kids really enjoyed it because, you know, what kid doesn't like fire? Um, and uh, this year we might roast marshmallows, which I was told that was an excellent idea. <laughs> so um, we'll try some biochar. Um, through the past 20 years, as first the Compost Club and then uh, Conservation Works took on that uh, nonprofit and rolled it into Conservation Works and then teaching that recycling changes everything lesson and bringing worm bins and things to school. So, um, I'm not quite sure what school this is anymore, but um, the kids are always very engaged when you bring you know, thousands and thousands of worms. And uh, creating compost for that is super exciting as well. Um, and then, if Apple Blossom was very excited to pull the worms, um, and they uh, just today had you know, 10,000 worms that some of, well, actually it's not some of the other one from, it's uh, Terravesca now, they've renamed, but they donated $300 worth of worms, 10,000 worms, 10 pounds of worms to us, and um, letting the kids just you know, mash through, not mash, but gently um, pick up 10,000 worms is pretty exciting, but I had to restrict them to one worm at a time to transport because then they're just you know, moving masses of worms and drop and get squished. So. You kind of have to control that when you have thousands of critters. Um, so the big thing is how we do this program. Um, that's the big challenge, right? There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of responsibility. And um, like I said earlier, without Sunny, this program never would have worked all these years. And we still rely on Sunny a lot, even though I'm kind of taking on the portion at Apple Blossom. Um, Sunny is really integral because of the portion that her students are still a part of because our fourth and fifth graders can't quite do everything. And it does take a bit of time out of their education day to do this. And they're giving up their recess, essentially, for the time period that they're on duty as waste wizards. Um, but for the education component that we bring, there's like we said, we changes everything lesson. Um, we've uh, developed a reinforcement activity, a relay race, waste wizards relay race, um, and also a sorting activity using cards. Um, we used to have um, plastic um, representations of different products and things. Um, it's very cumbersome to carry two totes of stuff around from classroom to classroom, so uh, I kind of reformatted it and turned it into a card activity. So little cards, a packet of cards, a lot easier. And I have stuff sitting on the table here if you want to check it out afterwards. Is the current iteration of cards and this sort of thing. I have some biochar to look at as well. Um, and then uh, thinking also about how to create a game. Um, because kids love games, and if they can enjoy the activity of a game, having that reinforce what goes where, because you know, it's pretty simple for adults to figure out you know, a worm can only be vegan stuff, and 
uh, not the other stuff, and where things get sorted, that kids have a little harder time figuring out that stuff. So having a public game where they can repetitively and enjoyably reinforce that is going to be helpful. So still working on how to do that. Um, this is uh, one of the second changes everything lesson. You can't quite see it on the paper there, it's a little washed out, but there's a data sheet that they collect data on, and that's, those are the physical representations. That's back when they have the, the physical objects. Um, and they have the recycling relay race, uh, which that's when we transitioned to carts, and it worked a lot easier. And then let's see if sound works here. I have to push back. Oh. Yeah, it works. So there's nothing gives like more energy to speed than just to run around. So uh, that's a pretty good way to do that. So we just have the different fractions of you know, food uh, waste for pigs, food waste for worms, recyclables, and then um, paper uh, products. Uh, here's an example, which I also have over there, of uh, the sorting sheet. This is the, the one with the helpful hints, and then you flip it over, and it doesn't have all the pictures of the, um, of the, the foods or objects, and then you have to figure out which part it goes into. Um, so as far as what we do currently at Apple Lawson is we have a first and third, first and third grade lunch area that's separate from the fourth and fifth grade lunch area, and those are the two lunch areas that we actively work with with the waste wizards. Um, unfortunately, TK and K don't get serviced by the waste wizards. We still have a little bit that we have to work on. Um, that's one of our waste wizard champs who really takes it to heart. Um, and you'll see him in a, in a video clip a little bit later. Um, but um, TK and K snack lunch area really only separates out the um, cardboard trays. Uh, they don't separate out food, which is really the big fraction of methane producing and the, the, the mass, the weight, right? Um, so we need to work on that, but um, we would need to have another cart, we'd need to have another set of two kids, and that just hasn't happened yet. So, um, And custodial staff, you know, they're taxed, they don't have the bandwidth to really address that, at least currently. So, um, and after school, we don't deal with that either. I'm not there after school, and I'm only there two days a week, so. Um, a lot of it kind of doesn't get addressed. Um, and then classroom parties. We tried to do that um, two years ago, um, and it just was a really <laughs> tremendous amount of extra work for not a whole lot. And then, you know, pigs were eating all sorts of sugar, defrosting and cupcakes and things like that, so it turned out to be not so great either. So um, I have a spreadsheet here. The big takeaways here is really this is all kind of volunteer based. The green uh, boxes, those are um, district paid staff minutes, um, and so 93% of the time spent doing this program is volunteer time. Um, custodial staff takes care of it one day a week, um, and kids, uh, at, uh, at Boston kids, take care of distributing <coughs> the containers, sorting and monitoring during lunch, and then returning the containers, and then after school, some of these high schoolers come down and clean the containers, empty the containers into respective bins of recycling or green waste or whatever, and then resetting the carts the next day for the kids to come and take out. And kids miss 10 minutes of class in the morning to set out the carts before snack, and uh, then at lunchtime spend their lunchtime there monitoring and sorting out uh, the, the different uh, containers. Um, and uh, we're only capturing about 82% of lunchtime <coughs> stuff because we're missing the stuff from TK and K, and those are kids that are eating even less of their apples and drinking less of their milk, so proportionally way more, right, than uh, the, the older kids, um, and that doesn't address uh, after school or snack parties and things, so we're barely at that 75% compliance probably currently. Um, so as far as uh, spreading the success and replicating this, um, the Waste Wizards program uh, is a pretty successful program, I think, um, just based on uh, if, you know, Apple Blossom is sort of the pinnacle of this, it's working pretty well, and uh, other schools, we try to get them to that level. Um, and that's really through Conservation Works uh, as a nonprofit that I also work with uh, to implement that program and other programs uh, in sort of the general context of conservation, but uh, as far as the program itself, it really relies on volunteers. Um, so whether that's classroom volunteers, parent volunteers, you know, staff volunteers, whatever, 
Um, and uh, district and admin support is really integral to that. Um, but that's just at the level of like condoning it. Um, we still don't really have it at the level of them supplying the, the labor, the, the personal power uh, significantly. So SB 1383 is an awesome uh, thing that has now come on board because having to try to do this before, SB 1383 was a real chore. So it's really nice at least to have the district um, on board with knowing that they have to do it um, rather than trying to convince them that this is something that, you know, that's what we had to do previously. Um, but you know, we still have all those logistics and departments and other issues to deal with. Um, so like I said, uh, School Garden Network uh, is going to have a workshop around composting and soils. They'll be hosting an apple blossom in February. So if you're interested, check School Garden Network, uh, schoolgardens.org. We don't have a specific date picked yet. We have two that we're still working on, but you um, can fill out the survey and see which one you would prefer if you're interested in attending. Um, if you'd like to check out Conservation Works and see the other stuff we're up to, uh, you can check that out. Um,